definitely uh so uh, uh dr jimmy actually uh is our old friends in cto i think uh jimmy graduated from cto right jimmy yes yeah so dr jimmy is a uh, is an assistant professor in the department of uh civil and environmental engineering in the Polytechnic University. In fact, I also graduated from Polytechnic University. So his main research area includes air pollution and human health, airborne and football transmission of antimicrobial resistance and pathogens, and pollutant induced uh, immunosuppression in Chinese white dolphin. And I also understand Jimmy is also working on the, the lipid filler touching in the in dolphin now, right? So, so yes. an mm. area yeah, hope to collaborate. Uh, with definitely, you. we can collaborate in, 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 in the future. So today, uh, Dr. Jingling will present uh, implication of antibiotic resistance in marine culture for coastal environment quality and seafood safety. So uh, let's welcome uh, uh, Jingling. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks, Leo, for the kind introduction. So uh, today's topic. Um, I think that today's talk would, would concern a, a lot to our Southeast and Asian friends. And, okay, so we are we are looking at the uh, looking at the global trend of the marine culture farm and antimicrobial use. Okay, so now um, for, um, to achieve now uh, th this is really due to the. Drive, driven by the increasing demand for high quality food okay from supplied by the uh, marine uh, from seafood and mar including marine culture or marine capture and uh, you can also see um, over the over the two decades right, past two decades the marine culture uh, production it, and it has steadily okay uh, surpassed the marine culture and become becoming a dominant um, supplier of 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 the of the uh, seafood supply okay now th this is also a very evident and uh, increasing trend of the antimicrobial consumption in aqu uh, aquaculture and in in three years ago and the product all the way projected to 10 years later okay so uh this really concerns our uh, south a southeast asian countries including uh indonesia malaysia thailand cambodia uh, whatever Okay, and uh, on the global scale, uh, on the global context, okay, so the pharmaceutical the antimicrobial consumption will still be increasing, okay, uh, to support this kind of marine culture activities, okay, over in the next decade. So, uh, one important thing, as Professor Zhang Tong in the very uh, first talk he had given, uh, had, has given a paranomic uh, view on the antimicrobial the the antimicrobial resistant genes antimicrobial resistant pathogens or resistant pathogens or those things right and which can be shaped by human activities one of which is the aquaculture activities or marine culture activities okay freshwater culture and marine culture so as we can see see from these uh, examples even from the Baltic countries. Okay, so the aquaculture really changes the profile of antibiotic resistance and uh, and those mobile genetic elements. Okay, associated genes in the surrounding surrounding aquatic environment, and uh, this is uh, another case of uh, like a, a very intensive uh, fishery and marine culture industry. Okay, industrial marine culture. Uh, 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 production okay very intensive so the fish meal application really induces the antimicrobial resistant gene pur purgation okay in the surrounding water uh, in the sediment for example in this case so uh, which in which in turn okay which in turn the feedback is the global rise of those antimicrobial uh, resistance pathogens okay the increase uh, as an emerging threat to seafood okay it, so there, there's a two way. One is influencing the surrounding environment, okay, releasing by through release of antimicrobial resistant genes and as well as their carriers into the environment, now which 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 may in turn um, through the feedback loop through to from seafood to the coastal consumption uh, consumption groups, okay, which uh, pose pose this kind of emerging microbial 
uh, biological food safety and threats. All right, so uh, on the global scale, okay, so the from, according to the WHO, um, the foodborne and the waterborne diarrhea diseases, okay, uh, is an emerging, is a very uh, a serious issue, okay. So every every year, two point two million, over two million deaths, okay, occur due to this kind of foodborne or waterborne diarrhea diseases. Okay, around the world. So in China, for example, and the foodborne disease are represented by uh, over uh, almost uh, three, 300, 300,000 individuals affected and uh, more than 2,000 deaths during, during uh, 1994 to 1994. This is uh, an old record, okay? And a 40, among which 40 to 50% are caused by predominantly zoonotic uh, microorganisms. So, um, from a One Health perspective, okay, so the environmental uh, community and the clinical community uh, need to work together on a concerted efforts to tackle this kind of One Health issue, okay, of of the of the antimicrobial resistance uh, uh, spread through uh, spread along the human animal environment loop. So in in which uh, marine culture is a sec section, okay? So that we can eventually, we really want to reverse this kind of projected uh, trend of the antimicrobial resistance infection and the uh, antimicro antibiotic failure, okay? Uh, project up to uh, 30 years later, okay? All right, now, antimic for uh, eight antibiotic resistant genes are the, the basic unit, okay, the genetic basis of, of antimicrobial resistance. Uh, uh, it, uh, but this is not like a, a not really like syn synthetic or human induced uh, pollutant, okay, chemical pollutant. So it, it is really naturally occurring. It is really naturally occurring as a kind of host defense from uh, microbes to because they also need to compete with other microbes okay other competitors in the environment so antibiotic resistant genes okay is an ancient and a natural occurring okay you can find in, in the in the cave right uh, back to many many thousand years ago and also you know, our previous research uh, comparing comparing the pristine uh, down to 4,000 uh, meters deep in, in the South China Sea, okay, in the South China Sea from the, their sediment, compared to the sediment uh, in the more urbanized estuary, the so-called Pearl River estuary, okay. So we did this kind of metagenomic analysis and compare them. So we can really see this kind of gradient, okay, the end through this kind of, uh, from pristine to the anthropogenic impact, the increase in, in anthropogenic impacts really uh, drifted in this kind of natural antibiotic resistance, right? increasing their diversity, uh, uh, alter their diversity and abundance, as well as their uh, mobility and uh, ca uh, carriers, All right? So now, uh, down to, um, this topic, the marine culture in today's topic. Okay, so we really want to ask a few key questions. So, specific to marine culture, how does marine culture alter the structure and the properties of antibiotic resistance and its associated micro microbiomes in coastal waters compared to pristine oceans as a global baseline? And may such changes have uh, significant implications for coastal environmental quality and, in turn, for seafood safety? So, uh, to this end, we we conducted a sampling, a very comprehensive uh, field sampling, in one accredited fish farm. Okay, under the, our uh, Hong Kong government, uh, so-called Agriculture Fishery Conservation Department. Okay, AFCD accredited fish fish farm, in in the east east coast of of Hong Kong. This is so called Saikong. Now compare th this this side of the sea is relatively relatively clean now in terms of water quality, and the, the, uh, compared to the western 
western part, which is more influenced, uh, subject to the pressure from the Pearl River estuary, as we shown uh, in the previous slide. Okay, from the mainland China, the uh, land-based runoff. So we sampled uh, a few common uh, uh, common economic fish species and also the surrounding environmental uh, samples, like sea surface water and uh, sediment. Okay, now, first we did. Uh, perform the phenotypic screening. Oh, okay. no, we uh, so we basically we is we isolate the uh, the bacteria okay from this fish species, and uh, we subject to uh, subject those those uh, sorry subject those isolates to to Sanger sequencing and the PacBot sequencing for for their whole genome uh, whole genome analysis right so to understand their identity and also the genome structure and, and also a phylogenetic relationships with uh, known pathogen isolates okay strains uh, in human or in uh, uh, other matrices okay so we also conducted the antimicrobial susceptibility testing okay to see uh, they are phenotypic resistance type. Okay, and at the same time, we also conducted the genome type uh, assessment, just like Professor Zhang Tong just mentioned before the metagenomic sequencing. All right. So basically, we extract the genomic. Again, we extract the genomic uh, DNA. Okay, from these samples. Right, and uh, purify them. Okay, and purify all sorts of things. Then conducted the metagenomic sequencing. Okay, to understand the the uh, the struct the struct uh, the structure of the microbial community micro microbial communities, uh, the host taxa, the potential mobility of the ARGs. So, uh, and also we included one site. Okay, one site uh, from North China. Okay, from Northern China. So, and uh, coastal city Yantai. Okay, in, uh, which also houses a conventional industrial marine culture system without recirculation unit. Now, then we try to compare. Okay, now we, we need to find a baseline. Okay, from the uh, global pristine ocean. Now, this kind of Terra Ocean, uh, Terra Ocean expedition, and provided a very good platform. Okay, they. Uh, this is a a global uh, expedition in in major uh, oceans so they sampled a lot of surface water samples as well as other sam uh, sample uh, as well as other samples okay and uh, per, uh, subject all submitted all the all the uh, metagenomic sequences okay on onto the uh, website it's available online so they include those uh, surface okay surface water layer and the deep chlorophyll maximum layer, as well as the very even deeper, okay, mesopelagic zone. Right. So then we compared, okay, we compared our our own meta. No, we compare the pr pristine surface ocean, okay, globally as a baseline with our with our marine cultural resist resistome and the bacterial communities. Now we can very clearly see that the marine culture really all activities alter the composition of the bacteria communities in marine culture waters and the surrounding environment okay as well as we can see the this kind of marine culture induced activities okay also re really suppress the that biodiversity suppress the diversity of bacterial communities in marine culture waters compared to the global ocean baseline and uh, in terms of a lot of uh, uh indexes like species richness and the shannon and the kale index okay and uh, we also seen this kind of arg profiles also uh was all were altered in the marine culture waters compared to the pristine surface water okay so and we also see one interesting thing is the richness of the arg host so which means those bacteria that those bacteria okay taxa uh, carrying the ARGs, their richness did not change, but their identities shifted in marine culture impacted the coastal waters. All right. So, and we also observed the, the, the increasing proportion of ARG carrying contacts with MGs, okay, which means their uh, MGs in this case, which means that the, 
uh, the ARGs, are po the potential mobility of the ARGs are increasing. Okay. So more easily trans, maybe more easily transmissible to other uh, other uh, species. Okay, so the overall okay, so we can really see uh, compare the genetic context uh, between the marine culture resistance and the pristine surface ocean. And we can see that in the marine culture, uh, so it, um, the ARG some warm, no, so marine culture environments more harbored harbored more by no, sorry. The, the in the marine culture environment, okay, this okay were more carried by the pathogenic hosts, and uh, the frequency and uh, co-occurrence with the mobile genetic elements are increasing, indicating high potential for horizontal gene transfer compared to the uh, pristine surface ocean baseline, and which in turn which means uh, higher environmental health risks, okay, so. For the phenotypic, okay, we, we, because we, we just talked about the genotypic analysis, then we really isolate certain um, um, uh, species, okay, uh, resistant species, pat and pot uh, potential opportunistic pathogen species belonging to the Staphylococcus, okay, so uh, has been isolated from those fish edible tissues, okay, so uh, they carrying really. Uh, multiple multiple drug resistance, and uh, we use this uh, a online pipeline so called Meta Compare to compare to rank the risk resistance risk okay, and um, between the fish edible tissue and our also ongoing uh, study subjects like the urban air right inhalation also drinking water ingestion so uh, the preliminary results really show that. Uh, the resistance, okay, risk is more is uh, maybe the ingestion of this kind of fish uh, edible tissue may represent a more important role, but whether the cooking if would uh, reduce the risk or not, it's not clear. So maybe we can also have a further testing on that. So in sh in short, uh, for a summary, okay. So the pristine oceans are featured by naturally occurring stable antibiotic resistance. Okay, so no matter how deep, okay, no matter how deep the the the, uh, the ocean is, the naturally occurring antibiotic resistance, their profiles are relatively stable. Okay, across the uh, ocean gradient, and and also their potential for horizontal gene transfer is quite lower, and also there is a the host ranges of most non-pathogenic bacteria is very narrow, okay? And uh, the marine culture really induced a significant loss of bacterial diversity. Now, just like think about uh, antimicrobial use, okay? Uh, and uh, the industrialized, uh, westernized lifestyle really reduced the bio, uh, microbial diversity in our human gut. So we, we think this kind of mimic, okay, marine culture induced a significant loss of bacterial diversity and the contrast increase in mobility potentials and the pathogenic host ranges of a ARGs. And also resistant pathogens in marine culture products may call, may okay may have some implications okay for foodborne health risks for via seafood consumption to our coastal consumers. All right, but we ha still have a lot to do, okay, to substantiate uh, our uh, claims, All right? All right, so eventually we are really want to thank our uh, Stakey Laboratory of Marine Pollution to provide this, uh, to support this uh, collaborative research. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Jamie, for, for this uh, very interesting talk and important talk. I think the overfishing is a global problem. So marine culture mm. will be very important for provide nutrition to human, right? Yes. Yeah, but the the I think the now the marine culture is a uh, very dense. Yeah, and very dense. A lot of antibiotic. Mm. Yeah. So so how how can we solve this kind of problem in the future to provide think... safe and uh, seafood? Yeah. I, th I think um, maybe one one possible uh, option is using the no, two 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 possibilities. Okay, well, the one uh, they are they actually are right, uh, arousing a lot of interest. One is using 
and probiotic to control this kind of pathogens, right? Because fish disease, the uh, fish disease parasites or uh, or pathogen, the fish pathogens are also import are also a, a threat to to those seafood species. That's why, and that's why use of antimicrobials is currently okay is is a must. Otherwise, the fish farmers will lose a lot of uh, uh, fish supply. Right? So, but in the future, an alternative could uh, could be uh, like probiotic. I, I think uh, James, are you working also working with uh, Kevin? Right? Kevin Kwok in our in in our, in your ABCT department. Right? It's kind of doing this kind of pilot uh, trial. And another another control strategy maybe using the so-called uh, phage therapy yeah. phage therapy uh, is an actually an asian tool to control the bacteria yeah. to uh, which which in turn in this case to control yeah. the uh, pathogens yeah. you yeah. use their natural enemies yeah, yeah. yes uh thank you Jimmy. so maybe we don't have time so okay so, so maybe we can uh uh let those uh discuss in the discussion session yeah sure of course yeah, yeah. so our uh, next speaker with uh dr god uh, let's thank you jing Ling, and then uh, thanks. We thanks welcome our next speaker uh dr god jung dr god jung is an associate professor in department of chemistry city university of hong kong his main research area include RN bio rna biology chemical biology nuclear acid gene quadrupeds, gene regulation, and atomas. Today, he will present universal bound sensors for pollution monitoring control. Very useful. Uh, welcome, Dr. Uh, Gok. All right. Thank you, Leo. So, so since my, I hope you guys can hear me well. Uh, so, so my internet is not that good. So I will let Phoebe help me to play the video uh, that I pre-recorded yesterday in office. Yes, um, please wait a moment. I think, yeah. Is the sound good? No, uh, I think you might need to share sound when you share the video too. Yeah, yeah, I'm sharing the video. Can can you see the video? We can I, see the video, but no sound. But no sound. So I play from the beginning. Yes, no, you know, no, no. Maybe, uh, can you be said? Yeah, let me, let me try, let me try on my side, Phoebe. I, I maybe I know how to fix it very quickly. If not, then I can present to you. Yeah. Let's see. Yes, uh, quick. Uh, okay. Might be a little bit tricky. I mean, let me know if you hear the sound now. Uh, let's see. Thank you for the opportunity yeah, yeah, yeah. for me to speak. Oh, okay, so yeah. My name is Dr. Kwok. You can call me Kit. So today I'm going to talk about the universal biosensors for pollution monitoring. So there's a big problem in here. So globally, 80% of the wastewater falls back into the ecosystem without being treated or reused. Uh, and most of the problems relate to water qualities are caused by intensive agriculture, industrial production, mining, and untreated urban runoff and wastewater. And you can see uh, these few articles uh, uh, and websites from here. And since the 1990s, water pollution has worsened in almost all rivers in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And about 1.8 billion people use a source of contaminated drinking water, putting them in high risk. So the cost of water management are greatly outweighed by the benefits to human health. And looking into Hong Kong, so the sources of 
this uh, waste of water pollutants uh, mostly coming from sewage and including antibiotics and chemical contaminants. Uh, and then they go into the seawater and river. Uh, wastewater also can uh, be caused by the agricultural livestock uh, and that this provides the nutrients uh, for this algae in here. And these algaes can, uh, overproduction of this algae can uh, generate the toxin, which could also be uh, problems uh, to the seawater and river and then to the marine animals. And we are in particular interested to uh, monitor the antibiotics using that as a uh, initial uh, chemicals to, to, to interact with, uh, to detect. So antibiotics, so what's antibiotics? So antibiotics has been used for decades as human medicines and veterinarian drugs to treat bacteria infections, a large, the majority of the antibiotics are resistant to biodegradation in nature, so meaning that they cannot be eliminated completely in these sewage treatment plants. Uh, uh, so they will be uh, existed in the marine environment for a prolonged period of time. And this could cause uh, a lot of problems, including the AMR. And these are some classes of antibiotics uh, that we will talk about. Uh, and uh, I'm sure I don't need to say too much about AML uh, and just a few key things listed in here. So it has already caused 700,000 humans life worldwide annually and is expected to increase uh, over the next 20 years if we don't do anything about it. And it's worth to mention that the WHO has declared in 2020, the AMR will remain one of the 10 biggest threats to public health in the world. Uh, so despite uh, the substantial interest from environmental scientists, only a few studies uh, work on the occurrence, distribution, and fate of antibiotics in Hong Kong. Uh, the deficiency in this study can be attributed to two major causes. So one is there's a lack of efficient methods for antibiotic detection, and there's also an absence of practical tool for on-site analysis. So uh, what our project is aiming to develop some efficient technologies for continuous and effective surveillance uh, of antibiotic residues. Uh, in Hong Kong, Victoria Harbor almost received 20 billion liters of wastewater discharge from the surrounding sewage, sewage treatment plants every day. And as mentioned previously, uh, many of these antibiotics that are detected are resistant to biodegradation in nature. And from the study shown in China, uh, it shows that many of these uh, antibiotics actually cannot be removed in sewage treatment plants. So the efficiency of removal is less than 60%. Uh, in the situation in Hong Kong, uh, these few classes of antibiotics are uh, the highest uh, or most poorly removed uh, in this uh, sewage treatment plant. Uh, so this poses a problem that these antibiotics might have in the marine environment. And if we eat those seafood, then we have those problems as well. So this causes a significant threat to public safety and health. Uh, traditional or current technologies to detect these or monitoring these antibiotics, uh, either chromatographic uh, in nature or electrophoretic in nature, right, such as HPLC and CE, shown in here. So this method have severe limitations. So, for example, tedious sample separation uh, it involves specialized personnel to handle this expensive machine, and they cannot be used on site and they have to be uh, a high maintenance cost to operate them. There's also techniques that use immunoassays to, to do it. Uh, however, uh, there's also limitations such as cross reactivity between antibodies uh, and the production of antibodies usually require intensive labor and they normally have a huge batch to batch variation. Uh, and because an their antibodies, so they always have to be 
uh, in the free, uh, refrigerator or freezer. Uh, so the transportation and storage will be a big issue. So we hope to develop an optical essays that can provide some technical simplicity, uh, rapid response, uh, low cost and potentially high throughput and on-site analysis. Uh, so we have four aims of our objectives in this project. The first is to establish the Capture Select platform to generate new uh, antibiotic binding aptima. So that's the first aim. And then we hope to optimize and, and stabilize uh, the aptima that we develop uh, that can help to bind uh, to our antibiotic of interest uh, strongly and specifically. Uh, then we want to develop a structural switching sensing platforms to detect antibiotics and compare it with those traditional or current technologies. And if everything goes well, then we'll go to detect uh, the antibiotics in different sewage plant or even uh, in, in the seawater. So let's talk a little bit on Aptima first. So Aptima is referred as the chemical antibody. Uh, they are normally single strand DNA and RNA uh, selected through a process called SILAX. Uh, it's a technology developed in 1990s by Jack Shostak, Larry Go, and Joe Joyce. Uh, Aptima has comparable binding affinity and specificity with antibody. Uh, however, it has additional advantages such as low cost, high stability, scalable synthesis, uh, and then flexibility to incorporate chemical modification. So after switch, so meaning that when it uh, binds to the aptima, uh, antibiotics, uh, then it will change in structure and create a response. And those response, we can couple it with, for example, uh, fluorescent detection or visible light detection. And it's possible to recognize antibiotics specifically by having different types of secondary structure. For example, showing here the stem loop structure has these GAGT loops, and it's known that these GA loops in here can interact with one of the antibiotics, SDM shown in here. And conventional uh, SILEX process uh, is, has suffered from one of the main issues, which is uh, the target itself is relatively small. So if we need to uh, incorporate biotinylation into it, then it might affect the aptima selection process. So in order to overcome it, uh, we develop uh, uh, the capture select process that can allow uh, the demobilization to be on the oligonucleotide rather than the target itself. So this way we can then select for antibiotics without modifying the antibiotics in the first place. Uh, and this is a scheme to show this approach. Uh, and I'm going to explain it slower in here because uh, it's quite complicated. So first you have the DNA library shown in here. So N30 is the randomized sequence, N10 is the randomized sequence. And then we have a fixed region. Uh, then the first thing we do is then we immobilize the oligo and hybridize it attached with biotin. We have then the magnetic beads that can capture uh, with strap acid encoded magnetic beads shown in here. And then we will add our antibiotic of interest shown in here. Uh, if there's no interaction between the antibiotics with the aptima candidate, then it will have no reaction. Uh, however, if the antibiotics will bind to this N30 and 10 region, so then they will be released from this biotin uh, uh, and break this hydrogen bond, then they will be eluted uh, from the magnetic beads and these uh, eluted aptima sequence will then be able to go through the PCL amplification and then next to the next selection round. So normally you will perform around eight to more than eight rounds. Uh, so then you can enrich the aptima of interest. Uh, then at the end, once we decide, or oh, maybe the eight round is enough, then we will uh, 
add the next generation sequencing adapter to it, and then we submit that to a high throughput sequencing uh, library. And then after we get the live Aptima candidate, then we can uh, test the Aptima to see if it really binds to the antibiotics and how strong they bind. Uh, we can modify the DNA or, or trim the DNA to be shorter so it will save costs. Uh, and then we can further do chemical modifications to make the DNA more stable and, and resistant to different kinds of environment or, or pH conditions. And we have done this uh, first few uh, candidates. So for example, we have SVM, SMC, uh, and tetracycline and other antibiotics. And we've done 12 rounds. And these are some of the potential candidates uh, that we have generated. And now we are in the process of testing and verifying the binding. Uh, so after that, I think uh, we can then use some of these uh, Aptima sequence to create the Aptima switch uh, that can once bind to the Aptima, we can generate the response. And to generate or to create the Aptima switch, uh, so this is uh, some of the strategy that we are, we are planning to employ and we have done some experiment on it and it seems to show it works quite well. So we start going into all the details in the technicality. So basically we use uh, the Go nanoparticle and normally they will uh, absorb with the Aptima sequence or single strand DNA. Uh, when there's no antibiotics, so they will absorb, they will show the color. Uh, when the target, for example, SDM antibiotic showing here, then they will uh, bind to the Aptima and then it will not absorb to the go nanoparticles, then it will change in color. Uh, and then once we have this, uh, and then we centrifuge, then we move the go nanoparticle, and then we can carry, take these things uh, to perform uh, cascade reactions to generate the fluorescent signal or, or visible light signal. And this, we have designed two approaches to do so. So we hope that this approach can be used for all different types of antibiotics because uh, go nanoparticle should absorb to all these uh, single strand DNA aptima. Uh, again, without going to, into detail of how this approach works. So this is approach one. So basically we have different regions, A, B, C, D. Uh, and what happens is that once when there is uh, the aptima, uh, when there's the antibiotic, it will bind to it. Uh, and then we will have different concentration of these antibiotics. And then that will allow us to trigger different amount of response after the cascade of reaction. So, uh, so we will get a dose dependent fluorescent signal depending on the concentration of the antibiotics that are available. Okay, so this is approach one, and this is the preliminary result, and we show that uh, uh, we can theoretically generate uh, a large uh, full enrichment in the fluorescent signal. Uh, and then now we are testing to see if this uh, uh, in a more complex solution uh, with containing the uh, antibiotics. So we also have the approach two uh, is still caused or uh, mediated by the destruction of the tetrahedral nanostructure, the TNS. So it's a similar approach, uh, but the fact that we, we will not require any enzyme step uh, in this approach. So we have a few different types of oligos and that will create this uh, tetrahedral nanostructure uh, when there's no antibiotics. Uh, when there's antibiotics, uh, then it will uh, cause a change uh, in the tetrahedral nanostructure. And then again, it will generate uh, the fluorescence based on the amount of uh, the antibiotics present. And then this will destroy the tetrahedral structure and generate this fluorescent signal. So again, by a dose dependent uh, manner, we will have 
different response for the fluorescent signal. So again, this we have done some very preliminary data and it shows that there will be uh, full enrichment. Uh, and now again, we are testing by doing different amount of uh, antibiotics do we still see enough uh, response uh, to get a detection signal. So just a quick summary for the two approach. So approach one is isothermal, which is good. So we don't really need a PCR or, or thermal cycler to do it. And, it. and as you can see from the preliminary data, it has much better sensitivity and full enrichment. Uh, however, the limitation for the approach one is that it's longer incubation time. Uh, you will need an enzyme to do this reaction. And these are other features of this approach. Uh, for approach two, uh, it doesn't require an enzyme, which means that it might be able to uh, uh, be cheaper and also it can be done with the refrigeration of uh, the, the enzyme. Uh, however, the sensitivity is lower in this approach. So we are still working on uh, all the other Aptima as well on these two approach. Uh, we will probably have more data to show you next time. Uh, before we end, so we hope that uh, later on, if the approach work, we can then test it really on the sewage treatment plan, refers and other uh, sites. Uh, and with that, I would like to thank the groups uh, especially uh, Andrea, who has been optimizing the after switch platform and also uh, Beatrice and Danya for uh, working with the Capture Select platform and the chemical modification on the Aptima. And also I'd like to thank the Stakula for the support of the funding and especially also Kenny and, and Phoebe for all the support uh, and, and knowledge to me to, to a, New newcomer to the field uh, in, in, of me. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank and take any question. Yeah, so I think due to the time, it's a little bit overrun. So we only allow one question. So, so any question from the audience? Yeah, it, uh, if no question, then uh, we thank you, uh, Dr. Ko Chun Ki. Uh, inspiring and innovative talk. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kong. So uh, let's uh, welcome our next speaker, uh, Dr. Water. Dr. Water actually is my PhD student and, and he is now a postdoc in Department of Applied Biology and Chemical Technology, the Hong Kong Polytechnic University uh, under, the, uh, under the supervision of Dr. James, uh, James Fair. His current research focuses on coral in situ metabolism and physiological response to the changing climate by underwater respiratory and experimental manipulation. Uh, today, our uh, water will present non-invasive methods for assessment of coral health in situ. Let's uh, welcome Dr. Water. Thank you, Dr. Chan, for the introduction. Um, yes, I'm currently a postdoctoral researcher at the Hong Kong Poly U, and today I'm going to talk about non-invasive methods for assessment of coral health. And this is actually is a project still going on, and it's actually take it few years for the development. Actually, involved in my uh, PhD project. Um, so, um, in this presentation, particularly. Um, we are going to see, I will go very briefly through introduction of coral metabolism and then the, we will see what are the main techniques used and widely distributed to assess the coral health. And then we will see how we can apply these techniques um, through in situ observation of metabolic rate of, of the coral platygira carnosa and then we see some uh, conclusion. So uh, as uh, already um, uh, introduced before, um, corals has a high, coral reef in general are a high biodiversity hotspot with an enormous um, economical global value. And this value is coming from 
uh, mainly from fishing. If we think, for example, from South China Sea or Southeast Asia, um, fishing and seafood products are the main economy and the main uh, food for population living along the coastline. But also, um, we know uh, that uh, people enjoy uh, sport, water activities, uh, and also scuba diving or anything related to the ocean, like outdoor activities related to the ocean. So there is a lot of um, income, economical income from tourism activities. But um, one of important services also uh, for the um, coming from the corals is about the coral coastal protection. Uh, so basically, uh, corals and the reef in general can protect the coastline from erosion, from um, wave energy and tide uh, movement. So, um, but actually, um, in this presentation, I want to uh, focus more on the metabolism of corals. So um, we need to see, we need to understand what corals do to live and how they can acquire energy. So in a very simple uh, schematic representation, we know that corals is a combination of symbiotic, uh, is a actually symbiotic relationship between uh, the animal, which is the polyp side and uh, uh, endosymbiotic zooxanthellae, which are the uh, algal symbionts. So the main energy is coming from the sunlight and it can be used from the zooxanthellae to make the photosynthesis. And one of the um, results of the photosynthesis is the release of oxygen and production of sugars of, or carbohydrates. And this, um, this molecular can be used from the polyp side, from the animal, to make the, all the basic uh, metabolic processes, the rest, for example, the respiration process, and can in turn release the CO2 um, that can be reused and recycled through the photosynthesis. And we have a production of um, energy, which can support the uptake of dissolved inorganic carbon and calcium ion to make basically the calcification and to build the coral skeleton. So if you take these three main biological processes, take in mind this, uh, but actually um, coral is something very much more complex organism. So this is what we call coral holobiont. It is a meta-organism, so it's not only a combination of polyp and endosymbionts, but also uh, um, we have bacteria, we have viruses, we have other uh, microorganisms living together in this micro environment. And together they have basically, um, uh, they can recycle the energy, they can recycle the organic matter uh, through um, into inorganic nutrients. Um, and, and so all these, um, these uh, organisms and microorganisms can support the biogeochemical cycles around and inside the corals. So, um, uh, we have been doing, um, so basically, uh, if uh, corals can uh, have the energy, um, can acquire energy from these two sides and, and, uh, and, and address this energy for coral growth and standard metabolic processes, actually, we need to consider that we have some global impacts affecting the corals, such as increasing the greenhouse gases, which are causing um, warming of the ocean, so rising ocean temperature, and also reducing the pH of the ocean through the ocean acidification. But also we have a combination of uh, severe climate uh, phenomena like El Nino or cyclones, or if you think, for example, typhoon, especially in this area, in the subtropical area. And these global impacts, we need to also correlate with the local impacts affecting the corals exactly in the place where we are going to study. So uh, locally, we have a um, combination of coastal development and sewage 
treatments, which are releasing pollution, uh, increasing the turbidity. And we, we saw from the previous presentation, for example, releasing of, of microbes in the water. And, and this can increase the eutrophication of the seawater. Uh, we can uh, affect the, the dissolved oxygen in the seawater. So uh, the combination of these can be detrimental for the coral survival. But um, uh, we have been doing um, a literature, literature review of techniques to assess coral physiology in situ under global and local stressors. So we find out we um, we find out that from ninety from nineties to nowadays, most of the studies focused on primary productivity and physiology of corals under stress, while low. Um, with uh, minor uh, studies, we have only few studies focusing on light limitation or photo inhibition, inhibition of, of corals, specifically under, uh, for example, under turbidity events or deeper corals. And the, how these techniques evolved through the years. So the main methodology were always been fluorometric techniques. We think about, for example, diving pump with, with with which we can measure the uh, fluorescence of endosymbionts and the photosystem specifically, the photosynthetic efficiency of the photosystems, and also using submersible chamber and benthic chamber. So these are very common technique now that um, we can use uh, to monitor the coral physiology, but also uh, the sampling scale uh, evolved. So uh, if we know a lot about polyp interact, polyp endosymbionts interaction and what happens around the colonies, um, the, the, inter the scientific interest now is evolving more towards community study. So uh, we want to know more exactly on the coral reef in general, not only focusing on coral specifically, but also including the seagrasses or the, the, the role of fish, for example, in the energies of a reef ecosystem in total. So um, to talk about uh, coral physiology, um, we have been um, developing uh, specific protocols and techniques um, for this underwater respirometer. So um, this is particularly is called KISMI, is an acronym for Community in Situ Metabolism. It's an underwater respirometer. It is a it's actually a small benthic chamber that you can see here in the video that we can attach on the coral and we can measure um, dissolved oxygen and pH through dark and light incubation. So we can measure the respiration, the photosynthesis and the calcification as um, like main biological processes as I described before. And so um, we use this system combined with uh, most common diving pump and photographic analysis to measure several parameters on the corals. And specifically, we want to know at the beginning um, uh, what are the physiological limits of the corals. Um, we used Platygira carnosa. Uh, previously, uh, Professor Chiu mentioned that Platygira carnosa is one of the flagship corals. He's uh, believed to be stress resistant coral. And um, this is and this coral is um, distributed in Hong Kong water and widely distributed in Hong Kong water, so easy to find. So um, we we try to do a single stress experiment at the beginning to see what happened to corals when we stress them to high temperature from in this case 25 to 32 degrees and we observed an increase of respiration reduced photosynthesis and reduced calcification so in total we had a reduced of um, energetic availability indicated by this pr ratio but when we stress coral under low salinity actually we only observed reduced calcification because obviously we have a reduced amount of inorganic carbon or salts in the water, but increase of whiteness. So corals start to become pale, but not exactly bleaching at the, at the bleaching level. So if you see this level are pretty, uh, pretty much um, extreme, okay, for the coral survival. 
but we, we only could find that some stress events, but not affecting the bleaching. This is in the, in the short term stress. So um, uh, later on, we applied these techniques in situ. So we went uh, directly underwater to see uh, what these corals are doing. So we went to uh, Chek Chow, and this was a um, study for lasted two years from 2018 to 2020. And uh, we want to see if this coral, Patigira carnosa, how he's modulating, how he's doing uh, through the year. So uh, with a seasonal change. So if we mentioned before that uh, in Hong Kong and in general, in the subtropical uh, region, we have um, uh, two distinct seasons. Uh, for example, summer, which is the wet season, and winter, which is the dry season. Actually, I want to, um, to highlight that we can, um, we can find um, transition between these main two seasons. So I, I split the data um, between spring, summer, autumn, and winter. So we have been uh, going to Port Island every month for two years, and we collect both environmental data and coral physiology data. So starting from environmental condition, you can see that temperatures go up um, during spring to summer, and then go down around autumn and winter with the very low uh, temperature. Here in Chek Chow, uh, we never reached 14 degrees, as previously said, but uh, we had 18 degrees to about 30 degrees. And also salinity, we can have a, very, a low a drop of salinity, localized drop of salinity due to rainfall. And also um, a very high fluctuation of pH and also uh, the oxygen in the, in the water column. So um, if you see also the chlorophyll was very high sometimes, but this uh, actually I want to highlight that this area, it was, it is um, enclosed bay with a very shallow water. So occasionally we can have, we can expect this extreme value, but it's very interesting that corals actually are still performing pretty well in the water and still looking good. So how they can, they can actually survive in this environment and how they can modulate their physiology. So this is just few data um, that we have submit actually still under reviewing coral reefs. Um, we can see that through the season, coral can change and they can modulate their energy and they can allocate some energy for the standard metabolic processes and for example, the PR ratio, or sometimes they can allocate more energy for the calcification so they can grow better in one specific region, um, season, and, and, and also uh, change the color. The color also keeps changing. The color is a mean of um, chlorophyll content and then symbionts content. So uh, we can actually uh, take this data and, and correlate with environmental information. And we can see that um, not only temperature and salinity affecting the corals, but also uh, the pH. This is very simple. In red are negative correlation and in blue are positive correlation. So pH and temperature are negatively affecting the coral survival, the coral metabolism in general. But if we see the positive correlation, we have the turbidity and the salinity um, positively correlating with the energetic allocation. This means that turbid waters, which uh, means probably uh, more um, supply of food, and high salinity are actually good for, for, for the coral metabolism. And then we can also plot this data um, with uh, um, here, for example, uh, with the temperature salinity uh, parameters. And again, we can see that the energy here is mostly allocated when, uh, or mostly produced when, when the temperature is low and the salinity is high. But calcification instead is following another trend. So calcification instead is uh, like the, the um, around 25 degrees is the probably the best temperature and and condition for coral growth. So uh, all these data are available online. So um, in the, in the Pangea repository, we had also both the data from the underwater spirometer published 
on in Pangea, and also this uh, environmental data and uh, coral metabolism data. So you can access and and you can you can see this uh, data online. And then um, more is yet to come because, uh, as you can see from this picture, this picture is from published on a di Italian diving magazine, and we have been collecting also uh, the coral mucus from these corals, and we conducted this study also in Hong Kong marine parks. But at this moment, I cannot I cannot show you the the results, but the work is in progress. And also, we we are working in collaboration with a uh, with a CTU colleagues on uh, on proteomics on tissue and endosymbionts. And here, I wanna um, I wanna have a call for collaborators. If anyone has data from metabolic rates, water quality, I would like to 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 develop a model for uh, energetic performance. So if anyone were willing to share, you can contact me and we can we can have a study together so um uh, some major conclusion very briefly uh, we see that actually um these corals uh, these techniques um can be used to measure the metabolic and biogeochemical properties of corals under different conditions and then uh, we saw that um, um, in situ survey underwater survey um, highlighted the the, um, the salinity and pH affected the classification and whiteness level. So this may be a reason of why cor Hong Kong corals in general are a slow growth coral. And this finding can explain the high resilience pattern of coral. So maybe it can explain why uh, these corals are still there and why they are looking still good. Uh, but actually, what we are missing is the, the long term monitoring and the real time information. So, uh, of course, we cannot be in the water for 365 days per year, but we, we need to improve the, resol the um, resolution of this data collected uh, directly from the field. So I would like to uh, say thanks to all collaborators to these studies. Uh, from State Key Lab in CTU, the Chinese University and University of North Carolina, which, which were the, uh, the, um, the, the, the inventor of KISMI, and with special thanks to Professor Wells from University of Maine. And then thank you all for your attention and yes, open to your question and your comments. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Walter. I think you have already uh, two questions from the audience. So the first one is uh, from Lily, I think. Uh, do you have data supporting how various coral diseases affect coral metabolism already? Unfortunately, not. Uh, 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 can, ben, can Benza, not Lily. Yeah, first question. Um, we don't have data on on coral disease. Um, we actually we didn't observe any disease uh, from from underwater from these corals. So we, we we don't have this data. We don't yes we we, we don't know much actually. Uh, but yes, it will be interesting to see if there is any information on how um, the mic microbes in general, and if there is any pathogen effect in the corals. Uh, this is very common topic in, I think in a more tropical area and in Caribbean, but uh, I would say so far, not in Hong Kong, but yeah. Yeah, yeah I think that this is a chance for your collaboration with uh, colleagues in Philippines or Indonesia. I think, sure. I think there are more coral diseases uh, uh, discovered, right? And then the second question is, uh, do you think the correlation response of coral metabolism on the abiotic parameter study similar among coral species? Um, this is a very good question. Uh, actually, I think that the response is not the same with all the species because 
different species have different uh, metabolism. Some species, for example, rely more on the on the endosymbionts. More species rely more on the food, on getting the energy from the food particles outside. So they can have different amount of, uh, for example, fatty acid or lipids content. So they can have, they can respond differently to different stress. Usually, we say this. Uh, we, we define stress-resistant corals and, and stress-sensitive um, species. Uh, and this, in case, uh, Platygira is a stress-resistant species. So uh, there is a difference. Depend on the species, they can uh, respond differently. Yeah. Thank you, Walter. And, and thank I you. Think, uh, the time of the limitation, so we don't uh, have uh, more questions. Sure. Thank, so, thank you for your presentation. Yeah. So our next speaker with uh, is uh, Dr. Rick, Rick Lai. Uh, he is a postdoc in State Key Laboratory of Marine Pollution, City University of Hong Kong. His main research area include marine toxicity, nano toxicity, environmental risk assessment of different emergent contaminants of concern. Uh, today, Dr. Lai will present the inference of environmental temperature and salinity on the toxicity of thin oxide nanoparticles. Uh, let's welcome uh, Dr. Lai. Yes, uh, thank you for the introduction of Dr. Liu Chen. Uh, uh, since my network is not very stable, I will have uh, Grace to help me to sh uh, share the pre-recorded presentation for you. Thank you. Can Grace help me to press the next slide? Yes, we are moving on to your presentation. Thanks. Due to the small size of engineered nanomaterials, they have larger surface to volume ratios compared to their bulk counterparts. And therefore, they generally will have advanced properties than these bulk particles and are becoming more and more popular in commercial products. According to a survey in 2014, there were more than 1,800 products from 32 countries that use engineered nanomaterials. Consequently, it is expected that global market value of nanomaterials could reach 100 billion by 2025. However, such an expansion of engineered nanomaterials will inevitably lead to the potential concerns about the pollution in the environment. In the subsequent studies, we will use single-side nanoparticles as our target nanoparticles because in our review we found that it has relatively higher production and is popular in the commercial products while it has relatively higher toxicity than other nanoparticles and there is relatively fewer research efforts on it. The COP26 on climate change has just recently ended. The latest IPCC synthesis report suggested that the current global ocean surface temperature has increased by 0.88 degrees Celsius in the last decade. And they expect the global surface temperature is going to increase by 1.5 to 4.5 degrees of Celsius by 2100, suggesting that global climate change and warming is a critical problem. Likewise, in Hong Kong, the number of extreme hot days is increasing over the years. The precipitation is also recording record high. Such extreme and frequent weather events will inevitably lead to variation in temperature of salinity in the ocean environment of Hong Kong. Temperature has been the most commonly studied environmental factors about their impact towards the chemical toxicity. According to a previous literature review, the authors suggested that the toxicity of over 80% of the chemicals could follow two different models. In model 1, they suggested that the chemical toxicity generally increases with increasing temperature. In Model 2, they suggest that the chemical toxicity should be the highest at the two temperature extremes. The authors speculated that 
such variation in toxicity would likely be associated with the physiological responses of the test species. For example, in test a uh, model one, at low temperatures, the test species usually will have lower intake rate and metabolic rate, and hence they will take in less chemicals and are not effect affected. Alternatively, in model two, since the species are at the temperature extremes, they will spend a lot of energy to cope with this heat stress, and therefore they will have less energy to cope with the chemicals and then become more vulnerable to the chemicals. Indeed, according to a previous study that used single nanoparticles, the author suggested that the toxicity of single nanoparticles also increased with increasing temperature towards two of the three studied test species. On the other hand, salinity has been a less commonly studied environmental factor. However, based on existing literature review, it seems that salinity would have a similar effect as temperature towards the chemical toxicity. In a recent research, the authors tried to model the toxicity of five metals under different temperatures and salinities. They found that the metal toxicity would be the highest at the salinities at two extremes. They suspected that this is because at these extreme salinities, the test species would likely experience osmotic stresses and hence become more vulnerable to the metal. Uh, alternatively, for studies of single cell nanoparticles, the authors found that the toxicity of single cell nanoparticles generally increase with decreasing salinities towards all the test species. Apart from the potential osmotic stresses that may be faced by the test species at low salinities, the authors suggested that at low salinity, single cell nanoparticles would have smaller agglomeration and hence increased release of zinc ions, which would consequently increase their toxicity. Based on the above literature review, we could notice that both temperature and salinity could affect the physical chemical properties of the chemicals as well as the physiological responses of the organisms and therefore affect the toxicity of the chemicals. However, there is only few studies that can investigate the combined impact of temperature and salinity. In one previous study, the authors found that temperature and salinity could join and interact to affect the toxicity of single cell nanoparticles. They suggested that the toxicity of single cell nanoparticles was the highest at extreme temperatures, but decreased with increasing salinity. However, only one species, a marine diatom, was studied in the previous research. Therefore, it is necessary to evaluate and investigate how if other test species also have similar responses to single cell nanoparticles under the joint impact of same temperature and salinity. There would be three different research questions in this study. Firstly, we want to know whether temperature and salinity would affect the physical chemical properties of single cell nanoparticles. Second, what would be the toxicity of single cell nanoparticles under different temperatures and salinities? Lastly, would different species respond differently under these factors. The major hypothesis is that both temperature and salinity could modify the physical chemical properties of single cell nanoparticles and hence affect their toxicity to the test species. Test temperatures and salinities were selected based on the situation in Hong Kong waters. As shown in this graph, the temperature in Hong Kong marine water generally range from 15 to 30 degrees of Celsius. And another 35 degrees of Celsius was added based on the prediction of the IPCC report as a worst case scenario. The three selected test salinities also cover 
the common salinity range in Hong Kong marine water. In order to evaluate the impact of temperature and salinity on single cell nanoparticles, we put single cell nanoparticles and their bulk particles and ions into incubator to and incubate them at different temperatures and salinities for seven days. Afterwards, we measured the physical chemical properties, including ROS production, agglomeration size, ion release, and surface zeta potential, which are closely related to their major modes of action according to the previous literatures. The physical chemical characterization has generally proved our hypothesis that temperature and salinity could modify the properties of single cell nanoparticles. We found that for agglomeration and RS production, they generally will increase with increasing temperature and salinity. Meanwhile, the zinc ions released from single cell nanoparticles will reduce with increasing temperature and salinity. These findings lead to another question that is, how these modified physical chemical properties of single cell nanoparticles could affect their toxicity. To answer this question, we expose the incubated chemicals to different model organisms. In the first experiment, we expose them to T. Opus japonicus, which is a marine cobipod. It is a dominant taxa in the aquatic zooplankton communities, so it has an important ecological function and is a benefit species at intertidal areas where they will experience abrupt changes of temperature and salinity. These animals will be previously acclimated at the specific temperature and salinities before the experiment, and the test applied is the standardized 96-hour acutoxicity test with chemicals renewed in the middle of the exposure, that is 48 hours. This is the toxicity results of single cell nanoparticles along different temperatures and salinities. In our findings, we find that we found that the toxicity of single cell nanoparticles increased with increasing temperature but decreased with increasing salinity. Such results agree with the previous studies about single cell nanoparticles. However, this did not agree with any of the monitored physical chemical properties in these studies. For example, for release of zinc ions, which has always been attributed as the major toxic mechanisms of single cell nanoparticles. Its trend actually decreased with increasing temperature and decreased with increasing salinity, which is different from the toxicity of single cell nanoparticles. This suggested that the observed toxicity in this study could not be explained by any of the single physical chemical properties of single cell nanoparticles. Apart from the potential impact for the joint influence of several physical chemical properties of single cell nanoparticles at the same time, the physiological responses of the Kobe pod may also play a role. For example, at low temperature, we observed reduced mobility of the Kobe pods during the experiment. This may suggest that they may have entered a dormant stage which has been defined and observed by the previous studies. At this dormant stage, they may have reduced metabolic rate and intake rate and hence they are less sensitive to the chemicals. Another question is whether such response to single cell nanoparticles would be consistent among different species. Therefore, in the next experiment, we again expose the incubated chemicals to another model species, Xenostropus securis. It is a marine mussel, and it is living in a relatively polluted area in Hong Kong and has relatively high tolerance in temperature and salinity. Most importantly, they are a unique target group of nanoparticles. As shown in this figure, they are able to filter out single cell nanoparticles within one hour. The experimental setup is very similar. The animals are first acclimated to the specific test temperatures and salinities within one week. After that, they are exposed to the chemicals for another week, after which we will check different physiological parameters of the marine muscle, including survival, clearance rate, 
lipid and protein stocks, etc. The experimental results suggested that temperature, salinity, and chemical concentration significantly interacted with each other and induced toxicity towards the marine mussels. To better illustrate the results, we present our results in the following PCA diagrams. First of all, we found that at environmentally relevant concentration of single cell nanoparticles, they are not they were not inducing toxicity to the marine mussels. However, at a higher test concentration, we found that single cell nanoparticles were inducing adverse effect compared to the control. Therefore, in the following results, we will focus on the difference between the control group and the treatment group at higher test concentration. For temperature, we notice from the control group that high temperature alone could already induce adverse impacts to the marine muscles. In the treatment group, there was a similar pattern, but this time the high temperature seemed to be more separated from the lower temperatures. This may suggest that single cell nanoparticles may have deteriorated the performance of the marine muscles under high temperature. This is consistent to what we observe in the test using the marine copepod Tigreopus japonicus. Likewise, for salinity, we notice that low salinity alone could induce adverse impacts to the marine muscles in the control group. However, interestingly, in the treatment group, we found that it was the high salinity that induced adverse impacts to the marine muscles. This is not only different from the control group, but is also different from the observation in the experiment using the marine copepod T. japonicus. This suggests that different marine species may indeed respond differently towards the joint interaction between temperature, salinity, and single cell nanoparticles. In the next step, we try to correlate the physical chemical properties of single cell nanoparticles with the responses of the marine muscles under different temperatures and salinities. We notice that at high temperature and salinity, the first response of the marine muscles may correlate with the agglomeration of single cell nanoparticles. Therefore, we suspected that the adverse impacts may likely be due to the significant agglomeration of single cell nanoparticles and the increased filtration rate of the marine muscles under high temperature and salinity, which eventually result in increased uptake of the single cell nanoparticles. Therefore, we try to evaluate the bioaccumulation of zinc in the marine muscles after the exposure, and we found that the zinc level of the marine muscles indeed increased with temperature and salinity, which may suggest they have intake more single cell nanoparticles under these conditions. This study managed to answer three different questions. We found that temperature and salinity could modify the physical chemical properties of single cell nanoparticles, including agglomeration, RS production, and ion dissolution. And we found that single cell nanoparticles could have different toxicities under different temperatures and salinity and towards different species. Such difference would likely be a consequence of the modified physical chemical properties of engineered nanomaterials and the physiological responses of the test species under different temperatures and salinities. Therefore, the take-home messages are during the assessment of the risk of the engineered nanomaterials, different environmental factors should be considered and the physical chemical properties of the engineered nanomaterials should also be evaluated so that we can correlate their toxicity with these properties. We are particularly interested in modeling the potential toxicity of engineered nanomaterials under different environmental factors and different species so that we could accommodate the rapid development of the future nanomaterial market. This is the end of my presentation. I would like to give special thanks to my supervisor, Professor Kenneth Lo, as well as Professor Lee and Professor Jurisic. I also need to thank the General Research Fund given by the Hong Kong government to support this study. And also great thanks to the audience and questions are welcome. 
Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Lai. So uh, I think there's a one question from uh, Dr. James Fair. James Fair, would you like to ask in person or you want me to ask on your yeah. Do, do you yeah. hear me? Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, yes, thank you, Dr. Lai, for the presentation. I would mm -hmm. like to ask what was the exposure concentration of your nanoparticle and how is it compared to the environmental level, please? Yes, uh, we have two experiments. One is uh, on the marine copepod, one is on the marine muscle. For the marine muscle one, we have tried the environmental concentration, uh, environmentally relevant concentration of single cell nanoparticle, which is around uh, 10 microgram per liter in the water. But for the marine copepod, we, because it is an accurate test, we use a relatively high concentration, which can up to 15 milligram per liter. But uh, in the copepod experiment, we try to model the uh, toxicity response of the copepods under different temperatures and salinity. And we found that uh, at high, at the most toxic situation, that is the high temperature and low salinity, the chemical toxicity could actually be lower than the specified, uh, the existing water quality guideline of sink in the environment. That means that. Uh, so uh, this experiment also showed that there is a potential risk of single cell nanoparticles uh, under the current regulation of the water quality guideline. Okay, thank you, Dr. Lai. I do have another question if I'm allowed it. Uh, yeah. we, we know nanoparticle tend to aggregate at higher temperature and mm -hmm. higher salinity, which is higher ionic strength. Mm -hmm. One of your conclusion is that this aggregation can induce the toxicity to marine muscle. Would you yes. please further comment on it, how aggregation can induce toxicity? Uh, yes, this is another area that we would like to further study, but we don't have any like concrete uh, support for this. But we just think like uh, the nanoparticles, because every different muscles will have their own filtration size range, they may filter certain size of these particles. And so uh, we think that the agglomeration of these particles may like fit in the filtering size of this marine muscle and that's why increase their accumulation in their body. And this, uh, we, at this stage, we only check the biofiltration, uh, the bioaccumulation rate of zinc of, in the marine muscle and we did find such kind of uh, response under the high temperature and high salinity. Okay, we, I see. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, uh, any other question from the audience? Yeah, uh, Dr. Lai, I have one question. So you, you expose uh, those uh, nanoparticles to the muscle, right? Yes. And then, uh, do you think they will accumulate in their body or Separation will get rid of this uh, nanoparticle if, if we uh, put them in a clean mm -hmm. water for, for a certain duration of days. Yes, thank you for your question. It's also a very interesting and important aspect to be studied. Uh, what I can provide you to now is that we have checked the bioaccumulation of zinc level in the muscles after the exposure. And we did find they have increased like uh, accumulation of zinc along uh, different conditions of temperature and salinities. That means they should be able to accumulate zinc oxide nanoparticles in their body. Mm -hmm. uh, for depuration, I'm not sure, but uh, we have in our preliminary test, we have tried to expose a high concentration of zinc oxide nanoparticles to the marine muscles. And we noticed that during their filtration, they are actually uh, like uh, be able to produce some of the feces. Uh, feces, uh, that means that they are releasing some of these nanoparticles out of their body. So I think the depuration may also be, uh, be possible for the marine muscles. Mm. Yeah, it depends on how much they can uh, release, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, if they release only a little bit, but, but accumulate most of them, then maybe those muscles cannot be cell or they are no longer edible, right? Yes, it can be because we did find a high accumulation of zinc level in their body, but we haven't checked whether if we put back put them back in the clean water, will they be like 
able to reduce, how long will it take mm. for them to reduce to a normal level? Yeah, okay, yeah. So, uh, Dr. Jane Fair has some comment, right? Dr. Uh, Jane Fair? It's okay, it's a communication with Dr. Light because we are working on a similar experiment. Okay, yeah, yeah. So any question from the audience? If no more questions, then now come to the end of the morning session. I would like to uh, thank all the participants for your, your attention. And also Dr. Henry He, my co-chair, co and then the six uh, excellent speaker for the uh, very interesting and inspiration talk. So maybe uh, Grace or uh, Phoebe, do you have any announcement for the symposium in the afternoon? Yes, uh, just one. Uh, please come back in at uh, two o'clock p.m. Uh, in Hong Kong time or one o'clock p.m. and um, Cambodia time. Okay, thank, thank you, Phoebe. And also we have a panel discussion uh, chaired by Professor Wu. Uh, so, so please also stay until the, the panel discussion uh, session. Okay, so goodbye. Thank you. Have a good lunch. Bye-bye.